Hello, Florence, and good morning. Uh, I really wish I could be with you today in person. I was hoping to be with you in person. Florence is a magical city, uh, great food, wonderful people, rich culture and history. Uh, I sincerely hope I have the opportunity to be with you again in the future. Uh, but for today, I'll be joining you from DC, uh, but I'll be with you in spirit. Uh, I'm just so delighted uh, to address my colleagues in the International Bar Association, um, the IBA's contribution uh, to the administration of justice uh, over the past 75 years is substantial, uh, and this conference is an absolutely important event in driving forward the dialogue around international competition policy. That dialogue is more important now than ever. Today we're facing a competition crisis. For more than 40 years, antitrust enforcement has not kept pace with the need to rein in anti-competitive mergers and business conduct. As a result, in too many sectors, a few powerful companies dominate products and services, many of which are core to the everyday experience of the American people and the global economy. We see this in higher consumer prices, lower wages, fewer new businesses being created. The digital revolution in particular has brought us many great things, but has also enabled the emergence of extractive gatekeepers in critical parts of our economy. Dominant companies deprive people of their hard-earned money, economic opportunity. At the same time, they control the flow of information and public discourse and exert outsized influence in our political processes. This kind of tyranny, this kind of concentration and power is what the antitrust laws in the United States were designed to prevent. Yesterday, I understand you discussed the limits of competition policy and where they might lie, particularly in the digital economy. I am of the view that competition policy and enforcement are critical to addressing concerns regarding digital platforms. The new problems of the digital economy have arisen in tandem alongside dominant firms. And as a result, we cannot separate out their effects, but we do know that more competition would help in almost every respect. For example, would more competition and more competitive markets better protect user privacy? Well, given consumer demand for it, that seems likely. Would more competitive markets better secure our data in our systems? Well, security is a key product feature, so competition would drive it forward. Would more competitive markets respect limits on using algorithms to steal our time and attention, delivering more content with less scrolling? Well, time is a precious commodity, so that's a safe bet as well. I raise these questions because digital gatekeepers have an incentive to answer them differently. As long as there have been monopolies, monopolies have sought to protect themselves with Trojan horse regulation and scare tactic arguments. In the United States right now, we see an even more perverse version of this approach. We are hearing dominant firms argue against new comp competition laws because they say only they can protect privacy or secure data. New competition, they argue, might not protect user security quite as well as them or might not develop new products as well as they do. They suggest we should not trust an unknown potential new competitor to drive privacy or security forward. Instead, we should trust the dominant firms, the incumbents, who have overseen the emergence of this era, uh, which is fraught with challenges. It ignores that competition works to improve all aspects of a product. And the challenges we face are at least in part the result of its absence, the absence of competition. And that is the premise of our free market system. I strongly support passage of non-discrimination legislation in the United States proposed in our, by our Congress that would help break up the monopoly power of dominant tech platforms and restore competition to this much needed and important area of our economy. As we confront these and other challenges, I'd like to focus on the exciting work that the Antitrust Division is undertaking to enforce the law and promote sound competition policy. Separately, I understand you'll also be discussing today whether enforcement is dead in the water. I'm here to report that it is alive and well, uh, as to not only monopolization, but every aspect of our work. At the Antitrust Division here at the Department of Justice, we're firing all cylinders, working to use every tool we have available to promote competition and to meet the moment. I'm now about 10 months into my tenure at the Antitrust Division, and as I come up on my first anniversary, I'm absolutely amazed every day at the incredible work the division is doing. Our people are tireless, they're talented, they're devoted to the mission, 
and they inspire me all the time. We are litigating more than we have in decades. Since I was confirmed in November, the antitrust division has filed lawsuits to challenge uh, or obtain merger abandonments in six cases. Several other transactions were abandoned after parties were informed they would receive second requests. We currently have pending six civil antitrust lawsuits, the largest number of civil cases in litigation in the last 20 years. And we will litigate more mer tri merger trials this year than any fiscal year on record. Notably, this litigation occurs against the backdrop of nearly 3,000 notified transactions in fiscal year 22, which follows fiscal year 21 as the largest number of filings in any year since the reporting thresholds for Hart Scott Rodina were adjusted in 2000. At the same time, we have indicted 20 criminal cases since November, more than any time since the 1980s. We have ended fiscal year 2021 with 146 pending grand jury investigations, the most in 30 years. The division has prosecuted anti-competitive crimes in industries, ranging from construction, fence contracting, transportation, poultry, aerospace, and healthcare. Shortly, uh, simply put, we're just getting started. We've also dedicated ourselves to vigorously protecting the powerless against the powerful. For example, we stepped in to protect chicken growers, farmers, against anti-competitive practices in the Cargill, Sanderson, and Wayne lawsuit. Our success there is returning $85 million to growers, but more importantly, it requires structural changes to the industry uh, that will shift the balance of power back to the workers that are the real engine of that market. We have filed to oppose non-compete agreements restricting truckers, anesthesiologists, and other workers from switching jobs, and to address the misclassification of workers and independent contractors that deprive them of organizing rights. Last month, we completed a trial of a challenge to the Penguin Random House merger, uh, helping us uh, to help protect competition for authors. That was one of the two merger trials open on the same day in the same courthouse in downtown Washington, D.C., a first for the division that reflects our growing commitment to litigating cases and to vindicate the antitrust laws. It's an incredibly exciting time at the antitrust division, and every day I'm humbled by the team uh, and their work here. The antitrust division is not alone, of course. We have incredible enforcement partners within the United States and around the globe, and we are committed, deeply committed, to deepening those partnerships. The global challenges of monopolization in particular require a shared commitment to aggressive enforcement and effective complementary remedies. We must deepen cooperation among jurisdictions committed to shared values that underlie free and open markets. I've already seen firsthand that monopolists and merging parties seek to engage in regulatory arbitrage, attempting to play jurisdictions off against one another. This demands, requires increasing collaboration from enforcers. That is why one of the first inquiries we make in a merger enforcement matter is what other jurisdictions were notified about the transaction. And we regularly seek waivers from parties to enable information sharing with our international counterparts. The exchanges between our case teams on timing, theories of harm, economic analysis, helps us refine our thinking, and it is particularly important in the changing economy. We're learning together. And this results in better global enforcement. An excellent recent example, case cooperation in the merger space is our work uh, with Germany. As we both evaluated pr the proposed acquisition of Maersk's refrigerated container business by China International Marine Containers, CIMC. The merger would have combined two of the world's four largest suppliers, uh, four of the suppliers of refrigerated shipping containers, a critical component of our supply chain. And worse yet, Chinese entities would have controlled over 90% of the market after the merger. It would have cemented China International Marine Containers' dominant position in an already consolidated industry and fostered coordination as a result of common ownership. The Bundeskartellamt in Germany and the Antitrust Division collaborated closely through their reviews of this merger. Ultimately, we both recognized that the anti-competitive nature of the acquisition uh, and we took a stand against it. So thankful for the partnership of Andreas Mundt and the entire German team. 
The matter was a terrific example of international case cooperation. But we can still do more. For example, we hope to break down barriers to sharing confidential information with trusted enforcement partners. And we're calling on our Congress to extend our International Antitrust Enforcement Assistance Act to include information for merger notification reviews and to protect the sharing of internal agency work product with our international partners. We hope to work with other agencies as they seek similar changes, as I believe we need to increase information sharing among enforcers worldwide in order to maximize our effectiveness. Digital markets are an area where collaboration on approaches and techniques appears particularly fruitful. The UK's CMA has led the way in developing data units with specialized technical knowledge. The OECD Working Party that I chair, Competition Committee Working Party 3 on Enforcement and Cooperation, it's a snappy title, will discuss data screens in November, and DOJ is actively building its own capabilities in this area. We're really excited to collaborate and to learn from our partners overseas. We also have very productive high-level discussions through the G7 hosted in Berlin next month by, the, uh, by our friends in Germany and through our Technology Competition Policy Dialogue, TCPD, meetings of the EC, FTC, and DOJ. The cross-fertilization of approaches is essential to learning the best ways to address market power and anti-competitive conduct in these markets. So as I approach my one-year mark in my tenure as Assistant Attorney General of DOJ's Antitrust Division, I can say without a doubt that enforcement is not dead. It is alive and well. And competition policy and enforcement is as limitless as the ingenuity and effort of entrepreneurs in a free market. The antitrust division and its capable counterparts throughout the world are mobilizing to reshape competition policy and enforcement. And I'm just so excited and grateful for the progress we're making together.